if you'll remember, um, and I don't know if I just sent it by email or if I've already gone over this with you in class, but uh, we do have a slightly different schedule. Uh, it's going to take uh, today and part of Monday to finish up the book of Revelation so that your, uh, your test will not be, at, well, we'll see if we finish. Your test won't be until Wednesday of next week. And I'll be putting up a study sheet for you later today. Uh, the, the way I put it together, we've got an awful lot that we've covered on Acts. So the test will be just on Acts, the Unit 3 test, but the material from Revelation will be included on the final. Any questions about that? We'll consider that clear unless somebody pops up. All right. <clears throat> We've had these bowls of wrath being poured out. And we're approaching the final plagues. And the sixth one is going to rattle the earth and uh, bring judgment on Babylon the Great. It's hard to tell, but the the tone is is turning. Um, the um, the answers to the great mystery are being answered. So these angels have announced the fall of Babylon. Babylon being the uh, name of the empire that had taken over Judah and Israel so many years before, and figuratively talking about the powers that were a threat to God's people in the time this was written. Um, it says that uh, Babylon was the desolate home of demons, and God's people have got to get out of being a part of that worldly uh society because god is about to uh repay her for her sins doubly their her sins are heaped as high as heaven and her plagues are going to come quickly in a single day and everybody who profited from her will mourn her fall and so an angel throws a millstone into the sea to signify the destruction of babylon the power of course uh, controlling them at the time this was written, was Rome under Domitian. It says all the nations had been deceived by her sorcery, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints. In chapter 19, there's a celebration going on. Uh, heaven is praising God for his victory. And a great multitude is praising God for punishing the great prostitute. We didn't cover that in, in great detail, but the great prostitute is um, another evil power working with the land beast and the sea beast. Okay, there's a no sir somewhere. What was that answer to? Brooklyn. That was if we had any further question. I don't hear a thing. That was from earlier. Okay, I need to see if I'm having technical problems again. Can somebody pop me a message? You are hearing. My speaker should be on. You can hear me, but I just can't hear you. Uh, let me see. There may be a button here I can try. Okay, if, if you have anything, all right. Uh, Plunkett, Grayson Plunkett, did you have a question or name? <laughs> Please don't hear a thing. Let's take a pause while I see what's happening.
I think I'm back in. All right. Now, I do want to make sure. I feel like I've, I've skipped something here. Uh, does this seem like where we're supposed to be? Okay. It's going to be kind of uh, um, back and forth. Uh, thank you, Brooklyn. Uh, this uh, great prostitute had been associated with um, with the two land beasts. That's what I was asking you. We did cover the land beast and the sea beast. Did somebody tell me, is that correct? All right, let's try it this way. Somebody answer this question. Uh, I think I can hear you or you can type in your answer. Which one came first, the land beast or the sea beast? I got nothing. All right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, um, let me let me switch over to a thing where I can. Okay. All right. So I'm so sorry for my confusion. We'll be done soon. Uh, I've got it picked back up now. I think. So this supporter of the two beasts and who are. Uh, exerting great power. Uh, the great prostitute has been punished. And it looks like there's going to be a great celebration. And, and the announcement is made, the marriage supper of the lamb has come. And her bride has made herself ready. She's clothed herself with fine linen, bright and pure. She's clothed with the righteous deeds of the saints. So you use the imagery from other parts of the New Testament is obviously uh, this is uh, God's church, God's people, and there's been a great victory. But what's going to develop is that you may have won a great victory, but that doesn't mean that you have um, that you've won the, uh, the the war is over. The angel begins to explain the mystery of the woman and the beast. There were at some times various myths about the emperor, that he was even, um, he was even um, resurrected. And uh, perhaps that came from the fact that sometimes uh, emperors came and went pretty quickly. And so now we have that the beast was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. So in the confusion of the people, the believers of the time when John was writing, uh, there's this confusion between following Christ, who indeed did rise and does rule, these myths that there's something supernatural about the powers of the world. We're told that the people are going to marvel to see that the beast has been revived. And then it says, the seven heads of the beast are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. Obviously, uh, everybody knows it's, uh, Rome is built on seven hills. It's gotta be a reference to Rome. The seven heads are a series of kings who will rise to serve the beast one hour. That is, yes, evil forces will rise again, but they won't last long.
I, I think that that's where I started. Ultimate victory. Let's go back. All right. All right. We did that one, right, Grayson? And full victory on the faithful side. Yeah. All right. So then we talked about this fall of Babylon just now. And they're about to celebrate the victory. Then an angel is explaining uh, what's still going on, why they're still having struggles. It says that the beast will make war on the lamb. In other words, the uh, powers of Rome and the emperor cult and all the immorality that supports that uh, will, uh, will come up against Christians. But in coming up against Christians, they're actually coming up against Christ. So the Lamb is going to conquer the forces coming against him and his people, because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And the people who are with the Lamb are called chosen and faithful. Over and over, Revelation in all of its extravagant imagery, keeps coming back to the point that you want to be one of the faithful. You want to be one who doesn't give in to the demands of this emperor who wants you to call him God, that Christ is the King and Lord. It says then that the ten horns and the beast will come to hate the prostitute, the immoral forces that are supporting. Uh, the power structure. They're going to make her desolate and naked, and they're going to devour, devour that should be her flesh and burn her with fire. So all of these evil forces will turn on each other. God is using these forces to accomplish his purpose. It says, until his words are fulfilled. The woman is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. There can be no question in their day and time, that's Rome. And all powers are subjecting themselves to Rome. And the Christians are being told, God is letting this happen for his reasons, but they're going to fall. Well, all of a sudden, we're preparing for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and a rider on a white horse arrives. He's the ultimate champion. He is called faithful and true. He judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes are like flame, and many crowns are on his head. And he has a secret name written. And he's wearing a robe dipped in blood. Now, we can't confuse him with the rider on the white horse that was one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That one was an imposter. He looked like the victor because winning all kinds of battles. But he was bringing war to the world. This is the true hero. This is... Uh, the one uh, in his description who matches the Christ that we met early in the book of Revelation. And he leads the armies of heaven who wear white robes and ride on white horses. The one who is called faithful and true has a sharp sword that comes out of his mouth and he's going to rule with a rod of iron and he will tread the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So before the end, there'll be terrible expressions of God's wrath on evil. Who is this hero? On his robe is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is, of course, Christ. And then an angel announces a gruesome supper of the Lord. Just above in the chapter, you've seen the invitation to the, uh, to the marriage feast of the Lamb. 
and it comes up with all kinds of beautiful imagery. But now the imagery becomes horrible in uh, the most literal sense of the word. This supper is going to be a scene of slaughter. An angel invites birds of prey to gather for the great supper of God. And those birds of prey will be eating the flesh of the evil kings and those who serve them. And then the beast and his kings gather for war against the rider on the white horse. The beast and the false prophet that's been supporting him are captured. And they are thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And then it says, the rest are slain by the sword, the one that the rider is holding in his mouth. And then at this supper of God, the birds gorge themselves on the flesh of those who've been defeated. The last days of the devil are coming. An angel binds Satan for 1,000 years. We need to stop for just a moment and, um, and consider how wide the interpretations are of this 1,000 years. I think that it is a, a sign of uh, people's great uh, desire, yes, uh, to know what these numbers mean, and they're looking for literal meanings. Uh, and as one of the jewels just posted, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, preterist, lots of words go with it. And why anyone wants to take what is so obviously a figurative number, 1,000 years. We've seen so many figurative numbers. I'm not quite sure. Uh, and you want to you want to say to the people, did you not read the verse where Jesus says no one knows uh, the the timeline for all these things? Surely, and you'll hear uh, uh, you you can you can deduce from this I am an a millennialist. The millennium is not the central feature of the Book of Revelation. It's one of many numbers that are figurative. Well, a thousand years is a very long time. And the, the revelation is being sent to people who are despondent and confused at how long bad keeps beating good. And, and it's, uh, they don't understand this struggle between the forces of, of good and evil. Well, there's a time when God does restrain the devil, and this is an example of it. The angel holds the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seizes and binds the dragon. And we know exactly who he is. That ancient serpent, the devil, Satan. And so the angel binds Satan for a thousand years and throws him into the bottomless pit and seals it shut. So for quite a long time, a thousand years, a yeah, big number, right? Uh, for a thousand years, Satan can't deceive the nations. But to knock the wind out of our sails, we're told after that, he must be released. Now, an um, image that has been interpreted many different ways. We're told that the souls of the martyred are going to come alive and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. I can see how premillennialists can imagine that this is talking about a a period of time when the Christians will be the predominant force in the world. And uh, just because 
I don't agree with them. Doesn't mean that I, I want to disrespect people who see it that way. I can I can see the desire to believe that's what's going to happen. But I just, if there ever was a piece of literature to be taken as figurative, this is it. So good and evil will rise and fall. That's what's going to continue. The Lord is in control of the devil and constrains him, sometimes for a long time, when the Lord wants to. And for God's own reasons that he doesn't always tell us, he sometimes lets him out. But we are reassured now in the 20th chapter of Revelation that the devil will finally be defeated. It's going to be defeated when he makes his last stand. And here again, if you are a premillennialist, uh, you're looking for some rather literal fulfillments of this prophecy. I take it as figurative, uh, a meaning uh, that could be applied to many different periods in history. Satan will be released after those 1,000 years, and he will deceive the nations of the earth. Again, I can see why people would believe it's describing the present time. But that's true of so many periods in history. And then Gog and Magog, names traditionally associated with the enemies of God's people, will attack the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Uh, the beloved city would have to be Jerusalem. Uh, let me take one more side trip for just a moment. We talked about premillennial and postmillennial and a millennial and you do need to skim over that again in your textbook um, although they go with other terms like preterist uh, and and be aware that there are different ways of interpreting the book of revelation those who are free millennialist believe that all of these terrible things we're reading about in this section of revelation will be uh, literally fulfilled in a uh, in great battles here on this earth. They also usually associate it with the restoration of the nation of Israel, which is often associated with the modern nation of Israel that was created less than 100 years ago. Well, if you were a post-millennialist, you'd be looking at this period of time and these great battles, and you'd say, oh, it already happened. It happened in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. And then they would say that all of these other things uh, are post, that we're living post-millennial. It's telling how God had already set things up. Well, as an amillennialist, I say it's telling about forces of good and evil that are in a realm above our own, in another spiritual realm, that have their repercussions on earth. And to pin them down to a certain time is, is to limit the full application of the truth. So back to Satan suffering his final uh, defeat. Fire from heaven will consume Satan and his forces. Well, you know, um, post-millennialism does say that uh, this great uh, cataclysmic battle will lead to uh, the conversion, let's see, that you're saying would happen, the millennium would happen after the world is converted. Hmm. I may have to pull out my book again, and uh, as you can tell, it is a confusing subject, or you have a very confused teacher. Both could be true. Um, it is true that wherever you're trying to place the before and after, that an overall message is the terrible things in, that are happening in the, in the world that are portrayed in these fantastic figures are an opportunity for people to turn back to the Lord. 
And yes, there it is wrapped up in the post-millennialist uh, approach that uh, it's going to bring, uh, things won't come to a conclusion until everybody's converted. And many uh, would tie in with that, particularly the conversion of Israel. Let's look for the broad meaning. When we get to the point and Satan suffers his final defeat, he and his forces are going to be thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, tormented day and night, forever and ever. And then judgment day is going to follow the defeat of Satan. The dead, great and small, will stand before the great white throne and the books will be opened and the book of life is one that's opened the dead are judged according to what they have done you know it bothers me that we don't hear much preaching about judgment day I see it reflected in my classes of seniors who aren't Bible majors, who, who have to give their reflections on, on their perspective on life, on their worldview. And it's just not there that this life is going to be the subject of the final judgment. I suppose there are probably several in our classes who observe court proceedings. Uh, I had that opportunity at a time in Augusta when there were several people in trouble with the law in the congregation. And you've heard the term sober as a judge. Well, it's a somber, it's a somber situation when you're in court and someone that you care about is accused of doing something wrong. It's even more somber if they've told you they did it wrong and you know that's not going to turn out good. The books are opened. Now, I don't know that it, courts ran exactly this way in antiquity, but my observation is that the attorneys try to have everything all organized, and in their minds, everything is settled before they get to court. They have made motion after motion with the judge, and everybody's hoping it's just going to follow their pattern, and this is how it's going to be. But when you have that sober judge seated in the elevated, uh, at the elevated bench, and that judge has all power to say, this is what the law means. This is how it applies here, and this is where we're going to go with it. That's the books being opened. And yet we're reminded that among the books is one where the names of the saved are written. When it says the dead, we are now talking about, that's everybody who ever lived. They're going to be judged according to what they've done. I uh, may have mentioned this in a class before, maybe it wasn't this class. Uh, a woman uh, that some of you will have met who, um, is a little bit older than I am, named Clydetta Holmer. She's the one who made those, uh, the bust on the monument that sits in the Bible building, the, the uh, statue of, uh, of, um, of the coach and his son at our football field, and most recently the uh, statue of uh, Rosa Parks that's been installed at Court Square in Montgomery. Well, before she became a famous sculptress, uh, she was a student at Alabama Christian, which at the time was on the campus of Faulkner University. And in high school, she wrote a paper and it ended up being published in a, um, in a pamphlet form and it was called Wild Oats and Harvest. Uh, I spoke to her a few years ago about, uh, does she still get money off of that? She just laughed. She says, that's still out there. That was just a paper I wrote in high school. And um, in it, uh, it made an impression on me. She writes about, she had a dream about Judgment Day. 
and all the people are up tribe by tribe and they call the Fulmer clan and there she sees her uh, sainted father and to me he is a sainted he, he's the one who baptized me he is my mentor and uh, I'm absolutely convinced he's up there and she saw her grandmother and she saw all these people and then they say Clydetta Fulmer of the something generation of Fulmers come forward then in her dream there's a giant movie screen and across the screen a movie runs and it's all that she ever did or thought or said and she stands in utter shame with these holy relatives of her and she's standing before god and everything that she did is now being on display imagine that i said your grade for this class is going to be determined by how much time you spent reading your textbook reading the bible reviewing for this class versus what else you did with your time and without you knowing it uh, i've had your cell phone recording everything you do and say okay now let me switch to the video and i'm going to show you all what this person did and you judge whether they used their time for studying the bible and they deserve to pass this class i don't want you to see the map my, my version of everything i did and said and you don't want anybody to see everything you did and said and you don't want to be judged completely on the basis of whether you had the right balance between the two but without forgiveness through jesus that's what everybody's going to face with that somber note it goes on to say at that point death and hades Two words for the same thing are thrown into the lake of fire and that's the second death well it does seem like he's been thrown down before but this is this is it this is the second death not only are death and hades thrown into the lake of fire anyone whose name is not in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire it's a figure of speech some people want to argue that it doesn't make sense to say that a body burns forever and ever of course it's a figure of speech but it's a figure of being tormented forever and ever so your choices are on the final judgment day you will be enrolled among the saved or you'll be thrown into the lake of fire and you want to be in the book of life you don't want those other books applied to your case the grand conclusion we're going to go straight to reading out of the bible for for the next little bit and tie this up Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to have to do a little switching. Hang on. Matter of fact, this would be a good time for me to stop the recording and start it. 